Hello friends, welcome back. My name is Ramon, how are you today? So if you haven't seen my channel, I do this video series called Formulation Talks, where as a cosmetic science student and someone with a biochemistry background, I come and explain and delve into formulation and ingredients based concept videos so that I can explain what I understand, hopefully at a much more simple level so that all y'all can understand very easily. And while it's something that I really wanted to base Glow by Ramon around and really bring that kind of knowledge to you, I also wanted to make it a platform where I could bring other industry professionals in and have them discuss their points, their perspective, their opinion, their experiences. And so with that, today I have a very special guest on my channel, Esther Olu, who's a cosmetic chemist based in the US. And so with that, we're gonna be talking about problematic and controversial ingredients in skincare, what their purpose is and why they're used. But before we get into today's video, I'm gonna ask that you hit the subscribe button and notification bell so that you know when I post more skincare, sunscreen, and fancy related content on my channel. Give the video a thumbs up. Down below in the comments, tell me what are your opinions on what me and Esther are gonna talk about? What are some of your favorite or biggest standout controversial ingredients in skincare? And also down in the description box, I'm gonna have all of Esther's socials, her Instagram, her Twitter, links so make sure you go follow her and support. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about four subsets of ingredients. It's going to be alcohol, witch hazel, essential oils, and surfactant. So basically, let's get started. First and foremost, let's talk about alcohols. And I've already done a video on this. I've done several actually explaining why I personally actually like to see alcohols in formulations, what they do. But on your perspective and what you've done and what your experience is, Esther, what's, what's your perspective on alcohols? Hi everybody, my name is Esther Olu. I am a cosmetic chemist slash formulator. Today we're gonna to be talking about inky lists and why we shouldn't be looking at them at face value. When it comes to alcohols, um, a lot of fear is around it being drying for the skin, but that's absolutely not true. When it comes to a lot of research in alcohols and cosmetic science or even dermatology, alcohols are used in very non-realistic conditions, not how we would use it in everyday skincare. So a lot of it has been in vitro. So that means it's either done in a test tube or on like some type of cell culture dish. They're patch tested on the skin or they're even put on the skin in very high concentrations. And when, you, when you're when you doing research, they don't do this in one day. It's done over the span of like weeks or even months over a long period of time. So obviously it's not realistic. It's not how um, a consumer is gonna put alcohols on their skin in everyday life. Another thing to note is Alcohols in skincare, they're very multifunctional. It's not gonna dry out your skin in the way that you think it's gonna dry out your skin. I'm gonna talk about several ways that we use alcohols in cosmetic science. So for example, alcohols can be used for fragrant reasons, aromatic reasons, or even for preservation. And one example of this is benzyl alcohol. So benzyl alcohol can be used as a preservative system to incorporate into a preservative system for cosmetics, and it can also be used for fragrance. Another example of alcohols are fatty alcohols. So even though it sounds like it's gonna dry out your skin, we also use alcohols to thicken your creams and your lotion. So this can be subtle alcohol, which is a very commonly used alcohol um, in creams and lotions, and sometimes even serums, or even cleansers to thicken, to make it thick, and even provides um, an emollient feel on your skin. Something I mentioned in my last video about alcohol is the fact that you have the simple alcohols, more like ethanol, isopropanol, and then you have the, as Esther just mentioned, the more emollient fatty alcohols. And the main difference is just the amount of carbons in the carbon chain. Simple alcohols have just a couple carbons or a much smaller molecule size. With the fatty alcohols, you have a much longer carbon chain. And with those, that's what's adding the excess emolliency. And that's what's giving, as Esther's mentioning, the body, the feel, the emollients in creams, serums, moisturizers. So another example of alcohols are humectants. So people, some people don't know that glycerin, also known as glycerol, is considered an alcohol as it does have some alcohol groups in it. And glycerin is probably one of a, a very popular humectant that a lot of cosmetic formulators incorporate into formulations. Like I said, it brings moisture into the skin. Despite it being an alcohol, it's not drying out your skin. It's actually providing a lot of moisture to your skin as well. Another example of why alcohols are used in cosmetics is to help stabilize emulsions. So emulsions involved with um, dealing with two immiscible liquids, for example, let's say oil and water. Emulsions tend to be very unstable and it's one of the aspects that a lot of cosmetic formulators have trouble to make it stable. Using alcohols in cosmetic formulations, especially emulsions, it's gonna help stabilize that emulsion so it can be applied to the skin. And there are certain alcohols that are going to help emulsify and help the oil phase of cosmetics and the water phase of cosmetics mix. So alcohols are a great way to help emulsify these two phases and help stability. Another reason alcohols are used are to be penetration enhancers. So the skin is very hard to penetrate. And a lot of research that we do is to figure out how to deliver actives in the most efficient way. And obviously water is not going to be the best penetration enhancer to get actives into the skin. And the reason why alcohol is used to help enhance penetration to the skin and 
allow delivery of actives and other ingredients to get inside the skin. And does that do just to lipid components of like the skin barrier? Due to the lipid organization of the skin barrier, not everything can easily penetrate through these structures. And alcohols are a great way to get inside these structures and deliver these actives. Additionally, when it comes to our cleansers that we use in the primary step of our skincare routines, Alcohols are a great way to not only thicken, as I mentioned, and alcohols are a great way to create foam and boost the foaming properties of our cleansers. So another reason that alcohols are used is as a solvent. So I'm going to give two examples. One reason why alcohols are used as a solvent is for extracts. A lot of the times extracts that are in your formulations cannot be dissolved in water due to their properties and alcohols are a great alternative to help dissolve that. Another example is glycerin. Like I mentioned, that is an alcohol. Xanthan gum, when dissolved in water, it creates a lot of chunks and it's so hard to get it to dissolve. So an alternative that cosmetic formulators do, we dissolve xanthan gum and glycerin to help dissolve it. And then we put that, that pre-mixture into the formula and it dissolves perfectly. That cannot simply be achieved by putting xanthan gum directly in water, so we'll put it in alcohols for a better solubilization. Okay, so pretty much through all of these examples, you can see that alcohols have a multitude of functions. An ingredient list cannot tell you what exactly a lab is intending to do with the alcohol. Am I using it to preserve my system? Am I using it to thicken the formula? Am I using it to solubilize something? An ingredient list is not going to tell you any of that. So as we can manipulate the chemical structure of an alcohol to have it act a certain way, an ingredient list is not going to tell you what a chemist is doing to that alcohol to let it perform a certain way. It's only going to say it's this alcohol. The intent of alcohols is not to be drying. They serve a multitude of purposes and they should not be demonized at all. So with that, you heard Esther. Basically, alcohols are very multifaceted. Beyond just simple alcohols and fatty alcohols, you have so many other things that can be incorporated into formulations. For example, benzyl alcohol, which functions as an aromatic and also a preservative function. But more so, just understand that alcohols are so multifaceted in how they're used in formulation. And just by looking at an ingredients list and seeing alcohol anywhere on it, you can't make the assumption of what it's going to do, how it's going to function, how the product's going to feel. It's so much more than that. So all that said about alcohol, let's get into our next ingredient, which honestly in 2020 had its moment, and that is witch hazel, which we primarily saw with the launch of Fenty Skin and the witch hazel being featured in the fat water. Esther, let's talk about this. Okay, so this is obviously probably one of the most controversial ingredients. I would say since about last year, I feel like there's been a lot of fear and hate about witch hazel. I feel like even saying this word, there's thunder gonna strike down on me for, for me for even saying it. But um, so we're gonna talk about different aspects when it comes to extracting witch hazel. One of the techniques that can possibly be used is steam distillation. This is a very po uh, popular technique that's used um, not only for plant extracts, but also uh, essential oils as well. So with this technique, steam is used as a gas to strip the plant and create the extract. The steam is directed throughout the plant. So there's a mixture of vapors that is collected and condensed to create a liquid. And the liquid is split into two phases. And with that, that's how they're able to extract with hazel. Another technique that can be used is solvent extraction. So with this, the plant can be extracted using, um, for example, alcohol or water. Whatever aspects of the plant that a chemist wants to keep, they solubilize it in the solvent. So to isolate the witch hazel extract, the solvent is going to be pretty much taken out and thrown away. So the last technique is fractionation. So this is a very commonly used technique when it comes to a lot of the oils that are used in cosmetics and even butters. So this involves having the plant going through the separation process and it's being divided into smaller portions. So chemists are able to, for example, separate the components that they wanna keep, like the, let's say the good components and then the bad components, bad for better lack of words, components that they don't want to use, throw away the bad components and keep the good components. So for example, prior to the release of Fenty Skin, a lot of people were looking at the ingredient list and seeing that witch hazel was the second ingredient. And obviously it's completely understandable to be concerned about that, but that can mean a lot of things. And the main thing is the concentration. For example, if the first ingredient was water and the second was witch hazel, the first ingredient of water could have been 99% and witch hazel could have been 0.5% and then you have the rest of the ingredients afterwards. And additionally, like Sean even mentioned, chemists are able to extract whatever aspect of the plant that they want to perform a certain way. No matter what they do with that witch hazel, it's gonna still be called witch hazel. The ingredient list is not telling you anything about the processing techniques that they use for witch hazel extract. 
It's not telling you about the quality of witch hazel. That will make a big difference of how it performs in the skin or the type of technologies that are used to get the witch hazel eyes there. All of those will make a big difference at how how it performs in the formulation. As witch hazel has sebum controlling properties as well as refined supports, sometimes witch hazel can also be used as a solvent instead of alcohol. Sometimes chemists will use that to dissolve certain aspects of a formulation. And so basically to wrap that up, as Esther just mentioned, with witch hazel, it's not so much the versatility of the ingredient so much as it is how it is processed, how it is extracted. And within a formulation, what really matters is A, the quality of the product, how it's in there, but also most importantly, the concentration of it because witch hazel does have a purpose, but it's more so important as to how much of it is in the final formulation and overall how good the quality is. So next we're gonna talk about essential oils and this is a hot topic for a lot of reasons. And obviously there's things like tea tree, which are things I actually personally love to find in my skincare. Tea tree I find has a lot of great acne fighting benefits to it, but there's so many other essential oils that you see in cosmetics, limonene, little oil, all those. Esther, what is what are your thoughts on essential oils? So essential oils are super popular as they have anti-inflammatory and antibacterial aspects. So similar to witch hazel, which we just talked about, the way that essential oils are extracted make it a very big difference to how it's going to perform in a formula. An essential oil in a formula is very different from directly applying essential oils onto my skin. It's going to perform differently. It is not the same and it should not be treated the same way. So additionally, when it comes to essential oils, which I think people confuse sometimes, is that when looking at an ingredient list, you will not know if that is the essential oil in its purest form whether it's a synthetic essential oil or whether that essential oil was adulterated. So these are three aspects of essential oils that are common in formulations. And no matter what aspect of essential oil it is, whether it's pure, synthetic, or adulterated, it's gonna be called an essential oil at the end of the day. You're not gonna know which, which one of it it is. So for example, adulteration is a very, very big, I would wanna say problem in the industry, not only in cosmetics, it's, it's very common in food as well. So this involves putting oils that are not even the actual essential oil, something similar to the essential oil into the product. So this is actually how companies save money. Adulteration also involves adding um, aromatics or it can even be adding carrier oils. So like I said, you're not gonna know when you look at an ingredient list, whether that essential oil and the formula is adulterated. So sometimes, even essential oils are, are added in very, very minimal concentrations. It's not going to even do anything in the formula. They just add it to tell a story to market to a consumer. And then sometimes, obviously, essential oils are added for fragrance. So kind of going off of this a little bit, a couple questions I have just because it's something that's come up and we've touched on a little bit in my formulation based classes. But with essential oils, kind of going back to how alcohols formed, and you mentioned some of the benefits when we when you just started this, there's obviously other benefits to essential oils, such as antiseptic and antibacterial. With essential oils and formulations, do those have functions as aiding in the preservative system overall? That's a good question. So ultimately, it really depends on the concentration. They're great for antibacterial properties in a formulation, but it cannot be used alone as a preserving agent. It can help aid in boosting a preservative system, but it's not good to help preserve your cosmetics on its own. And then my second question is obviously you and I run in similar Twitter circles and we see a lot of people, or we see the aftermath, the secondary like part of people complaining about essential oils in formulations and they don't want them and they're like, oh, they're like, well, for your skin. But as you mentioned, a lot of brands use them for the fragrance as well as storytelling properties. Do you think slash do you find there's a demand to have them in skincare products? Oh. This, that's a very good question. I wouldn't say there's a demand. What I've been seeing is actually quite the opposite. There's a demand to not have fragrance or essential oils and cosmetics. And on Twitter, I don't really follow a lot of people. The chunk of people that I see that are asking for like fragrance free, essential oil free, is not reflective of a brand's um, consumer market. What I'm seeing is I would say a small population compared to millions and millions of people. And the reason why a lot, a lot of time that fragrance or even essential oils are added is because, for example, in creams and lotions, some of them have very fatty notes and structures in it that is gonna cause a very horrible smell. And while some consumers might say, oh, it's fine, it's fine, that's not reflective of the entire consumer base. So while you may be fine with like it smelling bad, not everybody is gonna enjoy that, which is like why companies are gonna add fragrance and essential oils to counter that smell. Okay, and then the last topic for today, and obviously it's a little bit more of a hot topic. We see a lot of brands specifically put this front and center as part of their marketing and advertising, and that's SLS. And I've seen this around for a long time. What are your what are your thoughts on SLS and cosmetics? Okay, so similar to alcohol, um, there's a lot of fear, a lot of fear around sulfates, um, about them being harsh for the skin, irritating for the skin. And honestly, people are not wrong. 
about it being harsh and irritating. It does cause um, a lot of itchiness. It can be harsh depending on how somebody uses it. Applying full sulfates onto your skin, which is not realistic at all, is different from how, um, applying sulfates into a formula. It's completely different. And a lot of the research that have been done on sulfates, like I said, it's not realistic. They do studies over months or a long period of time where they're patch testing sulfates onto the skin. So at some point, of course, it's gonna cause some form of barrier dis dysfunction. Like I said, you're not applying 100% formula of sulfates onto your skin. So due to research, because sulfates have been shown to cause barrier dysfunction, this is why you see on a lot of products that they wanna go sulfate free. That's how they're able to make money. It's a, by putting this fear around sulfates, saying that they're gonna cause X, Y, and Z to your skin. So thankfully, due to cosmetic science, there's been a lot of ways to go around sulfate and to even incorporate sulfates into formulas. So for example, so one way to do this is by incorporating emollients and emectants to mitigate the harshness or the, even the irritation that you might experience with sulfate. This is gonna help make it more calming and more gentle on the skin. There are four classes of surfactants that are commonly used in your cleansers. So you have your cationic surfactants, you have your amphoteric surfactants. Sometimes it's called glitterionic. You have your anionic surfactants and your non-ionic surfactants. Nowadays, it's not as common to see only one surfactant in your cleansers. They like to use surfactant blends. So they use mixtures of, let's say, cationic and non-ionic surfactants, even more. Each class of surfactants, whether it's anionic or cationic, all of them perform differently on the skin. When you combine them, they're also gonna perform differently on the skin. So one example of like a blend is using one primary surfactant and a co-surfactant. So a lot of co-surfactants are used in cleansers nowadays to enhance the mildness of a cleanser. At times, even not only to enhance mildness, co-surfactants are used to boost the foam. So sometimes primary surfactants are not good enough to cause foaming properties and they'll use co-surfactants to help boost the foam. One example of this is cocomito propyl betaine. This surfactant in general is used a lot to enhance the mildness of, let's say, sulfate. Just seeing sulfate on the ingredient list is not gonna tell you anything. It's not gonna tell you whether that sulfate is gonna be irritating for your skin, whether it's gonna be harsh, unless of course you have some form of allergy to a sulfate. It's not gonna tell you how effectively it's gonna cleanse your skin. It's not gonna tell you how mild it is gonna be on your skin. It's something that you literally have to apply on your skin and just see how it works for you. So with that, that's pretty much an overall summary of some of the more controversial problematic ingredients that a lot of people have issues with. But obviously, as you can see, as Esther's mentioned, a lot of the issue comes with the concentration of these things in formulation. So obviously the poisons in the dose, but most importantly in a formulation, look at what else these ingredients are paired with. Look at what the overall function of these ingredients are in an overall formulation. And most importantly, most fundamentally, you're never gonna know what a product looks like, feels like, how it works for your skin until you apply it and try it out yourself. Anything to add, Esther? No, I think you covered everything really well. I just hope that going forward in the future years that we stop looking at ingredient lists at face value and just try the product. Just try it. <laughs> it's not If it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. If it works for you, it works for you. <laughs> and if it doesn't work for you, that does not mean it's a bad product. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much again, Esther, for taking the time out to talk to us today about all the amazing things around cosmetic chemistry. I really appreciate you talking to us, spilling the tea, telling us all the things about the ingredients. And again, down in the description box, I will have all of Esther's socials. Esther, anything else you want to say? Hopefully I'll be joining Ramon in the future on YouTube and we can do more videos together. Thanks, Esther. Huge shout out to Esther again. Her socials are going to be down in my description box. Please go follow her, go support her. My thing with this series, with these videos, is I really want to give a platform to really amazing people in the industry, people that I really respect, that I really admire, and Esther is definitely on the top of that list. Thank you guys for watching again. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and notification bell so that you know when I post more skincare, sunscreen, formulation, fancy content on my channel, and in the comment section, what are your thoughts on some of the things Esther had to say? What are some of your own opinions? Do you have any questions? for Esther. Drop those in the comments box. I'll make sure she sees them. And thank you guys for watching. Bye.